machine learning, artificial intelligence, even Gen AI, it's doing, and it's fantastic, generate images or even movies nowadays. But one of the things that I think is really exciting and is maybe not as well known is the application of these techniques or versions of this, these techniques to engineering, to science more broadly. Neil's right. A couple of decades ago, the engineering and aerospace communities discovered that they could use big machines to simulate fluid dynamics around objects, and that given a big enough machine, the simulation would be faster than all of the work involved in literally creating a life-size model and taking it for a test in a real wind tunnel. Now, speed forward to today, and we're now talking about how we can use machine learning models to speed up what would usually be done with a CFD simulation on a supercomputer. Once you've trained that model, and we can go into the details, the actual inference is basically real time. So basically the way to, to look at it is you can use machine learning to, to inside a code, you know, to try and improve, let's say a model, a turbulence model, a transition model, some sort of chemistry or physics model. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we've seen the greatest, greatest success with what we've been doing, but also what quite a few startups and, and you know, partner ISVs are doing is surrogate modeling where you basically train a model on prior data that then can act alone. Whereas a CFD simulation takes hours, days, you know, long time, right? Uh, yeah, and, and obviously HPC has helped to make them run quicker, but there's various, you know, algorithmic and physical reasons why there's a limit to how fast you can make it. Um, you, you ultimately are going to struggle. If you really want it to be close to real time, you're going to have to make some massive compromise somewhere in accuracy that makes it not possible. And so lots of people spoke, oh, could we, with GPUs, make a CFD code run in, in 30 seconds? And that's just not been the case. But with this new ML technology, it is actually becoming a possibility to do that. And if you can imagine just giving you like an example, we speak to some automotive customers and probably people that listening may know that often they're in a studio, a design studio, so styling. And so these designers may be working on clay or increasingly now a little bit more digital things, but they want to get an answer straight away. Oh, this, this car looks really sexy and nice, but does it have a lower drag? Does it help with fuel? If you can actually have a pre-trained model and then you just pass it like a scan of the geometry, you know, there's lots of clever camera technology now, mm -hmm. you may be able to get an answer out immediately and they go, oh, that looks nice, but it's bad for the performance of the vehicle, so let's do something else. That's the potential transformation. And you're saying you're saying the designers of these vehicles, like electric cars, presumably there's this trucks, motorbikes, I mean the works. You're saying that they're actually working in clay? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I should explain that. Uh, not all, but uh it and it's it's for I'm told very good reasons. So if you're if you're really and most people don't realize this. Yes, there's a lot of talk about aerodynamics and, and fuel efficiency and all that, but a lot of cars are still very much style driven because you don't pick a car because it has a CD value of 0 0.25. You pick a car because it looks nice and probably has the cup holders in the right place. Yeah, and that's a joke, but that's actually true. A lot actually, of people... No, that's true. We 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 picked ours because because you know actually the dog was happy with the back seat. Um, yeah. you know, it was so style driven. Those. Most uh, aircraft, less so. You care more, is it going to stay up in the air? You don't really care how sort of nice it looks. So automotive in particular uh, and cycling uh, are usually style driven. And that is the tension between engineering and aerodynamics and structural thing and the design groups. And so the more that you can give the designers something fast and quick, even if it's not fully accurate, that that is one potential application of these um, sort of methods. So simply being able to speed up the design cycle for those designers, they're working in, I can't believe this, they're working in clay. They could scan. You can, you can cut little bits off. That's why, you know, it makes it quick. I get it. It sort of makes sense. It does make sense. It's, it's squishy, right? And it's much more tactile than staring at a, a what is frankly a, a 2D representation of a 3D object on a screen. I, I get it. So hmm. it sort of makes sense to do it in clay. So they can shave a little bit off here. They can put a flange on there. They can fiddle around with the geometry, the physical geometry of a car. They scan it, they pass it over to what is essentially now a pre-trained machine learning model that's been trained on the last decade of all of their CFD results. And they essentially just are doing inferences out of that to work out if that car has got a good coefficient of drag. Yeah, or you know, whichever. The problem is that is the vision, but it is 
to set, well, probably people would know this, it's actually quite hard. <laughs> These sort of ML techniques and the the actual work is, it's, I would argue, less mature than in the large language model space that has that has reached a greater maturity. And, you know, we're all using those sort of methods now. Things like Bedrock, you know, really help to give access to, to those models. But on the science side and on the engineering side, things are still very much in the R&D phase. And that's where we've had customers really come to us to ask, you know, our opinion uh, based upon our, you know, ML experience in other areas, how how they should go about it and, and whether the truth is, is the hype real, you know, can, can, and so we being a data-driven company have been wanting to do our own research and our own science to help answer that question so that when a customer comes to us and says, oh, I've heard about the potential for this, we can either say yes or no, but more importantly, give a context of the requirements to, to do this. Uh, sort of thing. It's the standard, you know, Amazon working backwards. I should say, um, because this is a quite a scientific area, you know, we're we're developing our own sort of codes and methods to be able to do the science and, and publishing papers and things like that. And we talk about that in a moment. Uh, but we're also working closely with a number of startups and ISVs who are also producing, you know, software in this space. And so we're trying to help them um, at a science level, but also a standard uh, AWS level, infrastructure level to help them to deliver that software to customers who want to use it. So we're, we're trying to do as much as possible to help the whole community to move forward. Some of the science, um, some ourselves, some helping partners. And we think by doing all of that, we can accelerate customers' ability to realize that possibility of a, um, yeah, a, a designer <laughs> predicting something very quickly. One of the keys to success for the large language models is the large bit, right? There, they have enormous volumes of data that they're training those models on. Um, and in fact, in most cases, they're using like the entire internet, um, yeah. you know, in, in, in the sort of the well-known cases. How much data are we using with these engineering partners? What kind of volumes of data are we talking about mm. here? Well, I think the first thing to say is, um, and I think this is a general AWS philosophy, is we we believe that the customers want to, you know, use their own data, keep their own data. We don't have access to their data. Right. Um, so because of that, we have generated some of our own data um, and, and that's data that we're actually going to be making available for other people to use to be able to train their own models and, and more do the testing and the open validation. So mm. we've been generating uh, data sets on, in this case, more in the automotive space. So to give you some numbers, around 500 different car designs. So we worked with a few companies and we're actually going to be publishing this quite soon. And each of them, you know, is running, uh, you know, on thousands of cores, you know, to, like the traditional HPC amount. And so, yeah, the data sets are quite big. So we're talking maybe seven, eight terabytes for, for a data set. Um, and, and that is the the challenge compared to large language model spaces. So the data is not openly available. It's very hard for people to develop these methods. Um, they may have some internal data, but then they struggle to be able to collaborate with academics because they don't want to give their entire history of data to somebody. Yeah, so cool. we're trying to do our bit to also generate some, you know, open source data that people could use to test different software out and methods um, without having to rely on their own very sensitive sort of commercial IP. Um, so we're doing this all with open source models. They'll should be in, in the next month. So we should probably do another one of these once they're out. This is actually in the context of a, a workshop that I started oof, six years ago before even being at AWS. This uh, automotive CFD prediction workshop. It's basically where all the uh, OEMs and uh, software companies come together and academics to work on a like a standardized case, like an open case, and people are trying to improve the methods. So we uh, we created a a machine learning group. So Ford are the ones who have supplied the geometry, the open source geometry to this workshop, and so they've helped make sure that these. 500 variants of the car is one company upstream cfd who who kind of have a really enhanced version of open foam so they've helped make mm. sure that the um the actual process the cfd that we run for the data sets are really accurate and then on the other test case we have this new startup volcano platforms who have this really great uh, gpu native cfd code very efficient you can run really big cases quickly um, and that's then with a, an academic group at Loughborough in the UK who have got this other body. So it's it's really, it's not just us alone. It, it's definitely a collaborative effort to try and make mm. sure that uh, these data sets are relevant. And what's nice is we've already had pretty strong indications from the startups and ISVs and end engineering customers. Uh, they love the idea of something more open that they can more easily publish and share and critique. If 
if you want to hear about the results of the work that Neil referred to in the paper, check out this next video where we dive into the details of how, the, how good these models are, how quickly they learn, and how they measure up in real costs, both time and money. You'll probably be surprised. Oh,